PhD in English Language and Literature from the University of Mumbai. Dr. Preeti Shirodkar, an Associate Professor and has over 27 years of experience in teaching English Literature, Communication and Soft Skills. She has served in Ruparil College and MET as Department in Charge and a visiting faculty at IDOL, University of Mumbai, and is now working with Kohinoor Business School. She has conducted numerous training programs and delivered talks for the academia and industry and has been to Germany and England as a visiting scholar. A fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, she has also completed two minor RISA projects for the University of Mumbai and is currently a Board of Studies in English, member for the Dr. BMN College of Home Science, an autonomous institute to SNTT Women's University. She holds university ranks at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels and is a recipient of the B.G. Joshi Prize, the Kamal Wood Prize, the Professor Indira Parikh 50 Women in Education Leaders Award, the Indira Gandhi Women Achievers Award, and the Best Paper in HR Awards, among others. She has written seven books, 28 articles, and 26 papers, and presented 48 papers. She is passionate about teaching, mentoring, editing, creative and critical writing and engages in diverse social outreach programs. Thank you so much, Preeti, ma'am, for being with us today. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Dr. Mala, for inviting me to conduct this webinar. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Roma, for such a warm and long introduction. Um, today, as uh, the topic says, we are going to talk about creating a real impact through the virtual presence. Uh, we, whether out of choice or force, are now here in this situation, and we are uh, to do the best of it. And I think most of us are already online and trying to make a difference. So today, I'm just going to talk about how we can really be impactful when we are dealing with our students online. Uh, of course, I've moderated or changed the title very slightly um, from only teaching to both teaching and learning because one without the other is incomplete. And while we are teaching online, I think it's also important to remain updated and, um, you know, constantly reinvent ourselves as uh, teachers. So um, before I go on, I would just like to make a simple request that people can keep their video on if they wish, but please keep your audio on mute at all times until the end of the session when if you wish to ask questions, uh, it would be great because it's fun to interact. So please do unmute yourself. It would be great if you also turn on your video while you are asking questions. You could also ask questions on the chat um, during the session, but those will be answered at the end of the session so as to not break the flow of uh, the program. And Minoti is moderating the question, so uh, you can be assured that none of the questions will be missed. So having uh, said that, we are, uh, I will try and talk for the next 45 minutes or so on this topic, and then we will move into question answers. So if you try to see the context we are in today, out of the three things that largely comprise um, the teaching experience, right? The student, the teacher, and the medium. Uh, obviously the infrastructure and all are there, but those are just 1% of the whole story. Maximum impact that is created in teaching is the interaction between the student and the teacher and the medium that the teacher uses. And today I think the only, we have only one third of the actual change, which is in the form of, however, it is important, however, it is important that we change ourselves as per this medium, because otherwise we are not going to really be effective and we might lose our students rather than really keeping them engaged. Um, 
the only positive thing really in this situation is the fact that although we love face to face teaching our students are a generation of people who are constantly online so all that we really need to do is adapt ourselves and we will be ahead of the game so essentially i would begin with a problem because then we are going to work out the solution the problem currently with online teaching as it is happening because i have been taking feedback from students is that they are not always feeling engaged and it's not that they are never feeling engaged it's just that they are not always feeling engaged so what is going wrong when they don't feel engaged definitely our command over the subject our interest our capability of teaching has not gone down so we are doing the right things the problem lies in the fact that we are not doing things right because people are really not able to get uh, above the medium get above the medium in the sense get in control of the medium and therefore the impact that they are making on the students is significantly less so having said that how can we really go ahead if you think about marshall mcluhan who is a very very well known name in the field of mass media he says we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us so today the tool that we really have at our at our disposal is the internet is the online platform and it is for us to really let that tool shape us so that we can bring the best of ourselves to the medium and make the impact that we really desire to make so what my basic argument is going to be there are three roles that a teacher performs constantly right i'm not talking about the administrative paperwork i know that is an important part of teaching but currently we it is it is not something which is face to face so it is really something we can do at, at our own time in our own way and it is really not going to impact the way we teach so what i'm going to talk about is the thing that has changed and the thing that has changed has to be in the context of teaching not what we teach but how do we teach the assessment not what we assess but how do we assess and of course learning because we ourselves till we reinvent ourselves we are really not going to be able to go too far however since the focus is primarily on uh, primarily on becoming effective teachers i'm going to talk more about teaching than on learning so let us turn and look at getting the teaching balance right if you really want to get the teaching balance right it is and has always been about content and delivery let us go back to the time when we were learners right we have had some people who are very very knowledgeable but they have really not made the best teachers and there were some who may not have been the height of knowledge but yes they almost reached there but they were excellent teachers in the uh, sense of delivery so ultimately till you balance content and delivery we are really not going to be too much in a position to make an impact so the point is how do we get this balance right and i am really not here to tell you anything about content because each one of us teaches a different subject and we have to approach our content differently i'm going to talk essentially and largely about delivery but how that delivery is going to shape the way we present our content from here onwards so how do you make content effective if you really talk about making content effective powerpoint presentations are really the way ahead we have been using powerpoint presentations in the classroom or we are using the chalk and board method but now given that we are on the online platform it is very very important to engage the students visually and the only way because we really can't see them we don't know what they are doing we don't really understand their responses immediately so the main thing that we need to rely on it be 
can use the black white board and i'm going to talk about it at some point but essentially a presentation keeps them visually engaged and it helps them to associate what we are talking because there is nothing for us to get an immediate feedback we do get a feedback but that is at the end of the session and we need to make to about that with the use of powerpoint presentations however i have always been one who has made powerpoint presentations with a lot of animation because i'm even aware even now that the seven points you see is making you tempted to read them and i'm sure most of us have cast their eyes on all the seven points although i'm still stuck on point 1 right so this is with us and this is more so going to be the story with the children having said that the only way to keep them engaged in listening while reinforcing what we are saying visually is to make a minimalistic presentation use keywords use pointers rather than putting whole sentences whole paragraphs use illustrations because that is the way they will keep engaged visually that is the way they feel lesser of a temptation to fidget and in this minimalistic presentation do not use animation because while it is important not to expose the slide that works in normal circumstances and that is a technique that needs to be used in normal circumstances however if that is a technique we are going to try and use now in this situation you will realize that many a times the presentation gets hung because we have problems with the internet we have problems with the bandwidth we have problems with fluctuating signals and the problems keep multiplying plus we are not technology experts and there are multiple people on the internet trying to access different levels of information therefore it is a challenge if we try to animate the heavier the presentation the more difficult it is going to be to run it smoothly so the first thing to make a content effective is use a ppt but use it with minimalistic presentation on it minimalistic points minimalistic look minimalistic animation the second and equally important point is the role of stories anecdotes and examples now um we have people with science subjects we have people with maths and people are going to say how is that possible but if you are going to tell i mean as simple a thing as if you tell people 2 and 2 make 4 but you tell them i will give you two apples and two oranges and if you were eating them with your friend how many fruits would you have eaten it is easier for them to remember so rather than blanket figures blanket facts blanket statistics when we try and narrate stories when we try and narrate anecdotes when we try and make things in the form of communication in the form of telling of a story then that arrests and holds the attention of the listener and here we have to hold their attention and not only do we have to hold their attention but we need that to remain in their mind so stories are something which interest all of us it keeps our attention it helps us in retaining things and that is why it is important to try and weave our lessons online while using stories and anecdotes to illustrate what we are trying to communicate to them the third is using audio visual content um i have come and taught your students i have uh, come and conducted a program for the non teaching staff and i'm sure if you interact with any of them they would turn around and tell you that i like to use a lot of video and audio during my presentation but unfortunately the first session i took online and i started using a video i realized with experience that there is a time lag what you are seeing is five or 10th uh, sorry 1/5th or 1/10th of a second slower than i'm seeing it 
and therefore that lag is causing a distortion in sound it's causing a distortion in visual and it is creating more distraction than helping to arrest does that mean that we throw this technique out of the window not really because uh, the audio visual clips that are there there are some very beautiful youtube videos on any and every subject under the sun and i have been able to successfully use them to engage the students so what can we do now i think the simple thing to really do is to send them the links send them the video files on email and tell them to watch it before or after the session as you deem fit so that they get the experience of it they get the value of it and yet you don't land up getting into the problem the technology poses if one were to play the audio or the visual live the fourth point of course is to be able to supplement teaching now what do i mean by supplementing teaching we really need to understand that when we are supplementing teaching we need to share with our students things like worksheets worksheets there are quizzes there are jumbled words which you can use for or uh, you know any kind of other techniques that come to your mind which you can use to reiterate to drive home the concepts that you are dealing with in class this makes it interesting for them this makes it something that helps them revise and when they revise it they automatically retain it so if you have interesting worksheets multiple choice ones or things which look attractive they do solve it and therefore they are compelled to think about what you have spoken in order to solve those worksheets and when they are made to think about it when they are made to reflect upon it then of course they turn around and look at it more consciously uh, you uh, also can supplement uh, your content through discussion groups now when you are talking about discussion groups there are platforms online where you can break the groups into smaller discussion groups we need to understand that there are multiple platforms and i will talk about it a little more in detail in a while some colleges have like sis group of institutions they have purchased a particular platform some others are using free platforms but even if a platform has been purchased you as a teacher need to experiment with the different available platforms and go with a platform that best suits your need for a particular session so let us presume that you have uh, you know you have a platform you like or you have a platform that is officially been recommended by your college still if a particular topic requires you to break into discussion rooms or there is a particular topic which requires you to do something else which your platform does not seem to afford or does not seem to offer as a service it is important that you look across different kinds of platforms so that you are in a position to engage with these platforms so that you can create discussion groups and while you are doing this in any topic they can form discussion groups like they do in class and they can come back and report on their discussions i have attended webinars i have conducted webinars where this has been done and when you do this kind of a thing okay it becomes interesting because people again the entire fun of interaction that we are losing is afforded in these discussion groups where people get into smaller groups Uh, subgroups and discuss and then report their findings so this entire discussion this entire interaction can be held can be monitored can be successfully conducted and i think that is something that we really need to explore as teachers the next thing that we really need to look at polls or you know we have seen cartoons of students uh, you know online uh, on whatsapp there are cartoons being shared of students who have put a picture of themselves on a stick 
in front of the camera and they are lying down on the floor and eating and drinking and playing on their tab while the school teacher believes that uh, the student is very attentively watching because of course that picture of the person is so real that they don't understand that the person isn't watching. So having said that, when you engage people in polls, I mean, distraction is bound to be there. Even as I'm talking here, I'm aware that my intercom can ring. I'm aware that people who are in the house might create some kind of a sound. I'm aware that a lot of things can happen, right? So, but when there is a poll, when a poll comes up, it gives a person the opportunity to interact. It gives the person the opportunity to engage. And obviously that brings the attention of the person back. It also gives you a monitoring, a feedback mechanism. When you know only 20 people have voted out of 70 who are there on your, pres on your presentation in your class, you know possibly the others have just kept their video on mute and have disappeared somewhere. So technically it is a win-win situation for both the people who are attendees and the people who are taking um, the session. Finally, it is important to record, right? Every session that you conduct can be recorded for the simple reason that we need to have empathy for the fact that people lose out on their electricity. I almost lost my uh, opportunity to conduct this webinar because 10 at 3.30 exactly my lights went off and I wasn't sure when they would come back, but fortunately they came back. So it can actually happen that the students lose the uh, electric connection. Sometimes you are just thrown out of the webinar and you have to or the class and you have to join again. These are challenges of technology. So if you have recorded the session, the child can revisit it. Don't share it with one and all because then nobody would attend, everybody would expect a recording. But if you realize that a student has actually missed a particular part, the person is following up with you, or given the fact that they might be unwell or somebody in their family may have a challenge. If that person reaches out to you and tells you that I'm missing the session, but I would really want to know what happened in it, that, that is the time you can share the recording with them. So it is important to record those sessions to keep it as a record so that you might be able to share the content with the students later. Similarly, you can, and one of my colleagues has been doing this, you can record the session on your phone without holding an interactive one-time class and send it to them. Ask them to listen to that. And this I'm talking about practical subjects because the lady I'm talking about, Vaishali Pardesi, she teaches IT. So what she does is she sends out the recording of what are the concepts that she wants to teach to the students. And then when the students come online, she takes practical sessions with them directly through interaction. So she's able to cope with both. So that is something that we really need to understand vis-a-vis -vis what we want to look at in the context of the content that we want to deliver. We also have the freedom to keep changing among these methods, to turn around and use what suits us for a particular topic or a particular subtopic at any given point in time. Moving further, after having spoken about the content, we also need to understand that delivery needs to be significantly different. And in delivery, there are four aspects that I would like to talk about. The verbal communication, the non-verbal communication, the effective use of the medium, and the spatial communication, right? So let us begin by talking about the verbal communication. Now in verbal communication, the first aspect that I'm going to cover is your tone. Usually people, especially because they are talking to a machine, they find it very disconcerting and therefore they talk in a way that... Uh, 
um, going back, we were talking about the tone. And when we talk about the tone, many a times we realize that we are talking to a machine and that becomes a slight bit of a challenge for us. So when we are talking to a machine, our tone automatically goes flat. So we talk in a manner as if we are a part of a moronic recording. Now, when we do this, as you can see, if we are going on monotonously without varying our tone considerably, depending on the content, depending on what we want to assert, depending on the emotions that we are trying to display, without changing this tone, we are really not going to be able to engage the students. So we really need to think about three aspects of the tone. The first aspect is, of course, varying the tone significantly. So you need to vary it at all times. You cannot talk in a flat, constant tone. The second thing is it has to be emotive. Your voice needs to emote what you're speaking. You need to feel what you're speaking. It may be whatever you're talking about, textiles, or it may be something else, but that should come from within you. When you're engaged with it emotionally, when you're assertive about it, when you emote it, then automatically the students get engaged with it. And this is something that I'm sharing teacher to teacher, but I was given an, um, a subject which was not even an elective. It was an additional subject we were offering to students of KPS to hone their soft skills. So when the classes went online, I thought in the limited time that students had to be online, um, they would want the core subject. So I didn't offer to take my sessions online. And one week went by without my sessions, the timetable was out, and I got a messages or calls or emails from a lot of students, all of whom were asking the same thing, ma'am, why aren't you starting your sessions? And although these sessions were not marked, I wasn't keeping track of the attendance simply because it was just an additional input. I realized that most of them were there, most of them were engaged, most of them were very conscientious in attending it. So much so that that really wasn't the case, even with difficult papers where they actually had to give a university exam. The point I'm making is if you keep them interested, they will remain with you. And for this, <clears throat> with your varying and varying tone, the emotional element being brought into it, the third thing that you really need to focus on is making it conversational. If it's going to sound like a talk, like a lecture, we all know when we attend seminars that there is a tendency to nod off. Yeah, or to nod very intelligently, but have our mind somewhere else. To prevent either, when your tone is varying, when it is emotive, when it is conversational, it is all as if you are having a talk and we don't nod off when we are talking to friends or family. So if you can engage your students in the conversation, although it might be a one way conversation, I'm sure it will make them more perceptive and perceptive to it. The second thing that I would like to talk about is your pitch. Now, unlike the tone, which has to be varying, your pitch has to be uniform. You need to understand, and this is what I'm going to repeat after some time again, that you, many a times we tend to use the mic. If you leave it, it's too shaky. Your voice will not carry. And if you hold it, it you can see me how ridiculous it looks and how straight jacketed it makes me, holding it like this and speaking. It's very artificial. You know your teachers, you teach a class of 60, maybe 100. You don't need a mic at three feet. And that is all the distance that is between you and your machine. Whether it is a laptop, whether it is a phone, whether it is a tablet, they all have sensitive speakers. So you really don't need a mic. 
I've taken two hours class today. This is the second webinar I'm addressing because we shifted it from the 18 to the 17. But yet, if you keep your pitch at a steady flow, if you keep your pitch uniform, you really don't need a mic for your voice to carry through. And that is the second point I would like to leave you with in verbal communication. The third area that I would like to talk about is your diction. We need to neutralize our accent, there is no doubt about it, but sometimes it may not be very easy for us to do so. What we can, however, very, very easily do is to spell words. And I think when students are listening, out of habit, we throw names, out of habit, we throw places, out of habit, we throw concepts. And they may not catch it because this generation doesn't read. Often as a student, I too could not catch it. And yet I had to go to the library. Sometimes I would ask the faculty. Sometimes you don't just catch words you're not familiar with. And you take down the wrong word at times. I know of a student of mine who instead of writing benevolence, because the person didn't know it had written penipolence. Right? So there are cases like this. We need to understand that online it is all the more difficult because we are not allowing them to interrupt us in between. We can't see them to know that there is a confusion on their face. And therefore, whenever we are using words which we think they may not catch, we need to be receptive to it and spell those words for them. The final thing uh, or final point that I'm going to talk about under verbal communication is your speed. We either can't be a bullet train, we can't rush through what we are speaking because it needs to be absorbed. And yet we cannot be so slow that like the Doordarshan breaks, people go and have a quick cup of tea and come back before we start the next sentence. Right, so the pace has to be fast enough for them to be attentive and yet slow enough for them to grasp what you are really trying to enunciate. And that also helps you to keep up with what you really want to get across by emphasizing it. Of course, rather than face-to-face -face communication as against face-to-face -face communication, the pace needs to be, the speed needs to be definitely slower. It can't be as fast as in face-to-face -face communication. Moving on to the next area, the second area is in delivery is your non-verbal communication. In your non-verbal communication, you need to look out for five things. The first thing is your posture. You may be comfortable sitting, you may be comfortable standing, that depends on you. But depend on where, depending on whether you're comfortable sitting or whether you're comfortable standing, you need to define that as your teaching space. If you need to stand, you can use a dining table, you can use um, you know, a sideboard or something like that on which you place your laptop or phone and teach from there. If you're comfortable sitting, you need to understand that your back is properly rested and you're sitting erect when you are talking to the students. Because if you are slouching, if you are sitting like this, obviously you're going to disengage them. At the same time, if you're sitting like this with your face into the camera or very erect, you're going to be taught and it's going to start hurting you and you are going to get uncomfortable and fidgety. So you need to choose your posture about whether you're happier sitting or standing and then take on your sessions from there. The second, of course, is eye contact. And usually we tend to look at what we are speaking. But we, that is again a reason why we need to have minimalistic PPTs. We just need words. And what are we looking at? We need to look at the camera. The content should be in our heart, should be in our minds, should be with us. What we really need to be talking about 
and where we need to be looking is directly into the camera because that is the only way that people feel there is an eye contact people feel that there is an engagement whether it is the teacher or whether it is the student because if you're looking here and there and teaching or if the student sees you looking down looking here and looking there then automatically that person's engagement with you because i speak so that engagement for you is a lost cause the third is gestures we find it very foolish to gesture in blank space because technically we can't see anyone we can see only ourselves so we tend to be rigid and obviously if you're rigid you're not going to be effective you need to move your hand you need to emphasize a point you need to illustrate something that you're talking about you need to have your hands free you need to be able to gesture you need to be able to move them because that is one of the asset of a teacher and you really need to optimize and use those gestures to your benefit during an online class moving on to the fourth aspect of non verbal communication you need your facial expressions if you're going to talk about something without emoting it on the face your tone will automatically be blank so if i want to keep a deadpan face and say i'm happy to meet you i'll say i'm happy to meet you and of course there is going to be no emotion so it becomes unbelievable but i'm it's lovely to meet you when that loveliness comes in the face the eagerness comes in the face the emotion comes in the face it automatically gets carried to the voice and that is why we really need to understand the value of our facial expressions and finally dressing there are many uh, videos doing the round of people who dress well on top or they throw a jacket or a shawl and below that they are not properly dressed so there was a interesting video i'm sure most of you must have seen it of somebody who was wearing um, undergarments below and wearing a t-shirt on top and he suddenly got up not switching off his video in an office meeting only for everybody to see him in his underwear so we really need to understand that we don't know while we're listening something hap might happen uh, today also we had twice or thrice somebody by mistake touching the mute, unmute button it can happen that you show touch the reveal button and you reveal yourself your video goes off and you reveal yourself and at that time if you are inappropriately dressed or as a teacher if you think only this much is what i'm going to show so i'm going to be inappropriately dressed and god forbid you have to stand because somebody spill something on you or there is an emergency or whatever you expose yourself right moving on if you is the third area where you need to maximize your impact which is the medium in the medium the first thing is we have a lot of facilities we are just thinking about online communication either online teaching as a conversation or we are thinking about it as ppts but there are i have been teaching grammar classes online as fun for my friends and we do a lot of exercises on words we do a lot of exercises on uh, the whiteboard that is available so there are innovations and innovations and facilities and facilities but we really need to be aware of them the second is platforms i briefly touched upon this so i won't go into too many details i personally have used in the last two months about six to eight platforms there are bound to be many many more we really need to experiment we don't need to get hung up by one platform what suits my need what suits my students need is the best for me so explore platforms see what works for you the third is be aware of hacks that you can engage in for example uh, my brother who is a very senior professional in hr was supposed to conduct a webinar for um, kbs yesterday and when he was trying to check um about the poll for it um because we were hosting it minoti was online and between them they were really 
not able to realize what was happening because every time the pole was launched and would go off, everything would hang. So the first thing is I told them, try to keep the screen moving because that helps. So it helped a couple of times, then again, it stopped helping. Then the next time I told Minoti, I said, wait, first escape the slide you're on, then launch the video, then go back. So you need to understand you are smarter than the technology. You need to hack it. You need to find tricks to trick it and not allow it to have a sway over you. So you need to understand the hacks of what you're doing and turn around and use them to your advantage. The next thing that you really need to work upon is the medium. In the medium, you have got, you know, you have students who have their audio on, you have students who are doodling sometimes on the screen. You need to know that you have the control to prevent all of this. So you need to study the medium. You know what are the controls in your hand so that when they are trying to be mischievous, at least you can catch them. At least they don't have names like PTM60. You don't need to allow them into the class. Get them to rename the device. It takes half a minute. So these are things about the medium that we really need to know. And finally, about the medium, what we also need to know is that we have to understand that it has a lot to do. And if it still doesn't work for you, then you need to carry on. So you need to be able to move on. I was um, holding a webinar with SIS on a platform that was theirs and it got hung and the person was trying to do something at the back end, their IT person was online. Somehow he tried real hard, but it wasn't working and there was getting to be too much of a time gap. I would have lost my audience. So I decided to go without and we've had the webinar for two hours and not a single person got distracted. I got that as a written feedback from them. So the simple point is you even don't need a PPT. Your speaking skills are enough to keep them engaged if all else, including the medium fails. If your impact is all in its place, then how do you set the stage? Um, in setting the stage, you need to choose whether you want to keep, if you're using a phone, whether you keep it horizontal or vertical, because that will get the panoramic or the direct view of you on the screen. And in the phone, it always helps keeping your um, phone horizontal rather than vertical, right? So try and understand that you need to keep your phone horizontal as against vertical. If you're using a phone, don't keep it on a flat surface. Keep it propped up like this against something with the camera facing you so that your recording becomes easier. Don't keep it flat because that will not give a good impression about what you're trying to project. The third is it is important to use headphones uh, only, only if you are listening and there are multiple people in the room. While speaking, you don't need headphones, you don't need a mic because the more things you have on, the more are likely to be the chances of technological war. So the moment the mic causes a problem, there will be a drop in the voice. Then you'll have to say, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Am I audible? So you have to keep doing this. You don't need it. You have your voice to carry it forward, do it. And finally, you need to understand the distance from the device. It is important to keep an arm length along with a width between you and the device to get the right amount of profile in and to see that your voice carries effectively without really having to use any additional device to carry it through. Now, when you are choosing your space, 
Um, before I go on to that, like I was saying with technology, it looks like one of my slides has disappeared. So I'm going to talk about that before I go to choosing the space. That slide was about the spatial thing and in the spatial, which if you remember was the fourth point, there was the verbal, the non-verbal, the medium and the spatial. So the spatial slide seems to have been swallowed by technology. So the only two points that I was mentioning on the spatial thing is, one is that your spatial point needs to be a quiet place. The space that you're using, please use a quiet place. And the second is, which I'm going to talk about here on this slide also, is focus on creating a studio. So in choosing your space, look for three things. One is your backdrop. Now this is a natural backdrop. I have a wall which is painted like this. So if you have a natural backdrop which is arresting, use it. A painting, something which is interesting but not distracting, or a blank wall, or um, your cupboard, uh, sun mica, which is blank, whatever it is, use a backdrop that is not artificial. Many a times people use artificial backdrops in webinar and it looks really stupid and distracting. Yeah, it is very funny to have a tree and clouds floating by and you talking under it. That becomes a point of distraction and people are, and these people are talking about long down and whole opinions and you can see clouds floating by behind them. It sounds ridiculous. So choose a backdrop which is interesting, which and yet which will not distract. The second is the light. Choose a light that will come from the front of you and not behind you. If it is bright light, it can come from the side. Otherwise, your face will be in darkness. Usually, we tend to have the light coming from behind us when we are reading. But here we are reflecting what is in front of us and people are seeing our reflection that is in front. So if the light comes from behind, our silhouette looks dark. It is therefore important to face a window, face a tube light, face the source of light, or have it coming from the side at the most when you are online conducting a class or on a webinar. And finally, you need to create a studio if you have the space. A studio is a table, a place where you can keep your water, put your notes comfortably and teach. I have a studio, I don't use it so much for teaching, uh, for my webinars, but I have a studio when I'm attending my living philosophy class. Because the moment you don't have a studio, if you have a space, if even if it is small, it helps you to remain in focus. You don't get distracted by something that your child is doing. You don't get distracted by something that your husband says or something that your family or your neighbors or some other bird or animal or something dropping. Anything happening doesn't distract you. So if it is feasible for you, do try and create a studio when you choose your space. Moving on to the second area after teaching is assessment. Believing that we have taught very effectively online, we also need to assess equally effectively online. For that, I think using videos and audios is a good thing. It is good for, you know, sometimes it is not possible to engage in Vibers. Sometimes it is not possible to, uh, but yet you want to know what your students think about a particular topic. You want to know whether they're really able to speak or are they just not able to speak about a topic. So ask them to make a one minute video, a two minutes video, share it with you, mail it to you. And that becomes a very important and interesting tool of assessment. I've been doing it even without 
uh, online teaching, even in classroom teaching, one of my assignments in communication is always a video or audio because without hearing them out, without listening to them, we are really not going to be able to understand whether they are able to enunciate what they have learned and they are not merely parroting and pouring it out in the exam. The second is create viva voice in chat rooms in which you can evaluate your students. You can have group discussions, you can have personal interviews, you can discuss their projects, so you can do it online. The third is usually we tend to focus on concepts. Today, the industry is complaining that students are not fit for the industry. And one of the reasons for it is they are full of theory, which they learn by rote, unfortunately. And the moment they come out of the exam hall, it's one big zero, a clean blank slate. And if we don't want that, if we assess more and more through application, it becomes interesting for us as a teacher it prevents them from copying because obviously you can't copy application, otherwise it'll be too evident. And it takes the pressure off them and makes them absorb the subject in its essence. The next way is quizzes and things like that. Quizzes, jumbled words. There is a program called Quizzes, which is online. There are different other online platforms which give you the scope to create a quiz for free. You just create the questions, you create the answers and you share the link. And it computes your results, it gives you the breakup, it shows you who has done badly in which question and the students enjoy it because it adds its own animation, it adds its own pictures and it makes the quiz very interesting. So that becomes an interesting way to assess the students while yet engaging them. The next thing I'm going to speak about may sound a sacrilege to teachers. I think it is again something which is very, very effective. And that is the open source teaching. I mean, sorry, open source evaluation or what we call the open book evaluation. When we are talking about the open source or the open book evaluation, we need to understand that students also need to know what to copy and from where to copy. Copying isn't as simple as we as teachers would like to make it out to be. So rather than getting them into a road system, I would like to leave you with a thought that we can consider open source, especially in remote, where we cannot be circling around the class and trying to check whether they have any chits hidden, they're carrying any other things that may allow them to cheat, whether they are going to the washroom because they really need to go there or because they have something to cheat with, right? So rather than that, we can consider consciously open book or open source exams. And finally, we can give them the scope to look at LMS. LMS is now mandated by AICT, UGC, NAC, NBA, you name it, they want colleges to have an LMS platform. A lot of colleges have paid for it. Those who haven't, there are very good LMS platforms online. That again allows you to regularly assess and monitor the students at no extra effort. You just upload the questions on LMS. You can use those same questions for many, many years, if you have 100 questions, it will randomly select 10, 12, 15, and keep generating quizzes. So there is no question of repeating things. And yet, you get the assessment done without really having to touch it. So LMS, although we are afraid of it very often, is a teacher's dream. Finally, to how do you pave your way ahead? The first thing is circulate some do's and don'ts beforehand. Join 10 minutes before the session. Put that in writing. People who have weird names or unrecognizable names or numbers as their um, connection devices will not be allowed. Make all these rules evident to the teachers I'm mean, sorry, to the students, 
even before you start taking your session. So they are clearly in the know that certain things will not be allowed. The moment you doodle, you will be thrown out of the class or whatever. So make that very, very evident so that they are not tempted to get into doing things that would not be correct for them to do or the fact that you will close the class after 10 minutes. Finally, you need to give certain on the spots do's and don'ts like what I said at the beginning, keep your um, sound on mute if you want to keep your video on, that is your choice. So whatever are those do's and don'ts, there might be some specific do's and don'ts for a class, some instructions, you may have to switch on your Excel or whatever, you could give all those instructions when the class starts. Questions at the end, again, that is an instruction. Usually when we get into education, we are taught about the three hours of education. I'm going to change them slightly. These three hours of re-education in the present context for me are first realign the why. Why are you teaching a particular topic? What is your objective? What do you want the students to gain out of it? Once you know that, you can reinvent the what. You can reinvent, you can tailor, you can adjust the content to suit your objectives. And finally, reimagine the how, which will be your style, which will be your format, whether you want to use a whiteboard or a PPT, whether you want to use an Excel sheet or you want to use something else, whether you want to use a quiz or whether you want to use chat rooms, all these things can be decided once you have decided on your why and what, and then you can make your how so that your class ultimately becomes very effective. I move to the last point that I'm going to make, which is about learning etiquette. No amount of time is enough. We would require the same amount of time for learning etiquette, but we were here to talk about teaching and hence for the maximum time I've focused on it. However, we, till we learn, till we reinvent, till we attend webinars, we are not going to grow. So we need to use this time and use it well to gain a lot of knowledge, to access knowledge, access things which are now available for free. I've been doing Howard courses which are now free, which I would have had to pay thousands of rupees for. And hearing speakers whom I would have never dreamt of hearing before. Because again, they're there online and they're available for free. And they're there at a time that you can adjust your schedule around. So make the opportunity, make the time to learn, but understand the basics of participation. Where do you take the call from? If you are going to take the call from, I mean, invariably in webinars, I've heard people telling their children, Are abhi tak snan nahi kya kya? And it is ridiculous. It is, it speaks badly, not only about the participant, but it is unfair to the person who's conducting the webinar. So I think it is very, very important to understand that we take, whenever we are attending webinars, we learn to take it from a quiet place. There are people who lie down because we have that flexibility and try to attend the webinar from there. Really doesn't work. Sometimes people may ask you, I had, there was one webinar in which I was just attending and somebody knew me there. So they said, uh, Preeti, why don't uh, you unmute yourself and start your video and talk to our audience? Now, had I been inappropriately dressed, because I was not the speaker, I would definitely have been in more trouble than I wanted to be. So you need to understand where you are speaking from. You can't be lying down on your bed, um, being casually dressed or washing your vessels as you are listening to a webinar. The second is the art of stillness. There are people who see a lot of buttons and a lot of facilities, and then they spend their time tapping on all kinds of things, or their hand touches here, their hand touches there, because even when they are listening, their 
a device is not propped up. They have it in their hand, they have it in their lap, they have it on the table in front of them, and everything is touch screen, touch pad, touch everything. So by mistake a finger touches and there it is. Suddenly you're unmuted, suddenly you can hear background sounds, suddenly. So if even if you're listening, learn to be still. I have a friend who is attending one of the courses in philosophy that I'm doing with me. And invariably, the teacher has to tell the person at least twice or thrice during every class of one and a half hours that be still. Don't move around so much. Don't do this. Don't do that. Because everything you do, you know, even if you say mm -hmm, to yourself, it can be amplified and heard by the entire audience. So learn to be still. And finally, learn the value of learning. Unfortunately, as teachers, we tend to forget. And when we get into the learning mode, we become students, which we should, no doubt about it. But we become students to the extent that we want our certificates. We want to know whether the PPT will be shared. We don't make the efforts to make our own notes. I have already three diaries full of notes of the, PP, uh, the webinars I've attended in the last three months. So I think it is important to remember what we tell our students, make the effort, make your notes. It is not the e-certificates that are going to count. It is the learning that you really take away. And I think this is something that we need to remember and we also need to tell our students because this is a time when we can learn from the best, when we have no restrictions of space, we have no restrictions of availability. There are a lot of people who are doing a lot of great work online. I will close the talk by talking about the fact that ultimately, if my session has, or my webinar has been even slightly impactful, it is because one needs to appreciate the words, again, of Marshall McLuhan, that the medium is the message. However much you know your subject, however well you know your subject, you will not be effective in this time, and possibly this is not going to go away soon, till you are able to master the means of online communication. And for that, you really need to reinvent yourself and you need to learn and grow. Thank you for a patient listening. I'm leaving you with my email ID and phone number. You're always most welcome to touch base with me on mail or on WhatsApp. It will be great to be in touch with you. Ma'am, yes, there are two questions which came up in the chat box. Do you want me to uh, read them out to you? Yeah, let me just stop sure. share sure. and then you quote. Yes, Vinodhi. Yes, the first question was, uh, could you give inputs on areas of research review projects and research writing skills? Um, see, the point is research review and research writing are very, very big subjects. So I cannot give you many insights on it. But um, in the past uh, three months that I've been home, uh, personally, I have written two articles on LinkedIn. I've written one uh, chapter of 10,000 words for a book. Um, I have written, I am in the process of writing two more uh, chapters on two Minoti, did you? Uh, I was muted. Um, have you lost me at some point, or did you hear me till I said that um, I've been researching on various subjects? We lost you. You're crystal after. clear, ma'am. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. So, um, so my point is there are two things about research and writing. One is your area of interest, and the second is the passion to do research and to write. Right. 
so if you are passionate about research you are passionate about writing there is no dearth of avenues if you want to write short pieces and you are active on linkedin please post on linkedin create a blog there are enough readers post on linkedin there are enough readers if you like to record yourself post on facebook there are enough listeners you can post talks you can post podcasts you can post whatever you want on any topic that you have researched so that is if you want to do short research if you want to do longer research there are a lot of publications which are coming out online constantly okay um if you go and search for online research journals and plus your field of study you will get a whole long list of research journals which you could uh, contribute to they have their frequency they have their rules regulations find a subject of your interest marry it to a research journal and there you will have a paper so that is not too difficult a task and if you are really really a writer then go ahead and write a book on your subject it doesn't require too much effort otherwise i wouldn't have been into seven i'm not saying it's a it's like having tea uh, but if you're passionate about it you get there it it and there are publishers available right currently i mean everything is shut but again when things open you are you can contact publishers and give it out to them so this is the time i think actually to do a lot of research and writing and for that there is a lot available free and paid online to read so you can subscribe anybody who needs to know what to subscribe to or whatever can always write to me and i will be happy to tell you that yes ma'am the second question that came up in the chat box was um, ideally how long should an online session be it depends on three things okay um one is the platform because now for example if you don't have a paid platform anybody is not giving you more than they say half an hour but it is 40 minutes right so it's no use saying that let's have a 2 hour session because people will keep dropping out and then they will have to relog in and then you will lose the flow so it doesn't work so it's better to break it into capsules of 30 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever because it's always good to leave some time at the end for questions and answers so it is good to have a 30 minutes capsule if the second thing it of i mean if you have a paid one then well good enough for you then you can think of longer sessions then the primary th two things will come into play one is your content and second which is more important is your ability to master the medium if you can hold audience for 2 hours you will be able to hold them for 2 hours but if you can't hold them for 2 hours then just because you have content for 2 hours doesn't work then you need to break it up into four sessions of half an hour each so think about what content you have to deliver for example if it's something which is very very heavy maybe they can't swallow it whole you know nobody is going to be able to eat um let us say an entire loaf of bread at the same time but one can eat a ladi pav yeah so you need to understand if your topic is something which is small brief something which can be digested by the student the idea is to get the message across so if you need to give it in to them in capsules they will appreciate maximum 2 hours don't go beyond that because nobody's attention will be there with you and out of that you should have chat rooms you should have discussion groups and you should leave 15 to 20 minutes for question and answers so technically your teaching should not go beyond an hour and a half at the most um there is another question uh, yeah. 
from dolisha she says that we teach construction of a garment and it takes and take a, a three hours class it's a practical class so how does one teach in you know okay so construction of a garment so now for example okay i am nobody who can talk about construction for garment because that's not my area but if i were to give some general tips let us say for example uh, if to construct a garment you first need to decide the kind of fabric if that is your point one and you know that that is uh, in depth because there are different types of fabrics whatever 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 first of all collect visuals of those fabrics give them labels put it online or if you think you need want them to study you want them to see a 20 minutes video made by some fashion designer on it send it to them before get them to see it and then discuss it so you if it is a 3 hour session again break it into digestible units use the white board use pictures use images so in your ppt just have pictures of the actions they need to do pictures of the steps they need to take you know it's uh, if you have seen cookery shows online you really need to do that ek chamach chini lo then actually show them ek chamach chini kya hota hai because and then give them the time to take that chamach chini in their hand because by the time if you have gone to namak mirchi and whatever they will be adding the wrong proportion of everything and you will be a failure yeah obviously they'll blame you for a bad recipe so just send them if i were you and if i wanted them to carry 20 things i would have sent them the list of that earlier and told them keep this ready then to taken them step by step by step in smaller units don't do a 3 hour session running because even if it is practical in the house it is difficult to do it because there are people who are distracting there is noise people have to attend to different things so break it in sessions of 1 one, one and a half hours that will make it effective um there are no um there are no questions but uh, i think mr raju thakkar has raised his hand so i don't know whether he wants to ask a question or probably you know yeah, so anybody something. who wants to ask a question personally please unmute yourself and go right ahead with it or even make a comment uh may i say something ma'am oh please thank you uh, as far as the last question is concerned of ms shah of uh, Three hours of continuous training. Uh, all that I would like to say is that, at the most, a human mind can take one and a half to two hours. Yeah, yeah. So that after is what one, I also. Sorry. Yeah. After one and a half, maximum two hours, a person needs a break of ten to fifteen minutes. Else, physically, the person would be there. but mentally it would be just like on the downside true so i mean i wouldn't even say give them a break of only 15 minutes i that is why i said a one and a half hour session we need to understand the restrictions of work from home okay so the children are also in the house we also would find it difficult most of us to conduct a 3 hour session non stop from the house because the phone will ring somebody will drop something somebody will laugh cry shout and we will be carrying all that into our class so we need to understand give it in digestible doses if it is a 3 hours practical break it into either 2 one and a half hours or 3 one hours depending on how much content you can really club in digestible bits <clears throat> sorry uh me note if there are no other questions shall i go ahead and thank dr preeti yeah there aren't any questions ma'am i think this was the last uh, okay yeah. on behalf of uh, 
all the staff members, uh, not only of BMN College, but we do have staff members from uh, the Polytechnic, from our junior college, <coughs> and we are very happy to have staff members from MMP Shah College, which is our sister college, our law college, and our nursing college. We have uh, Renuka Madam, who is the vice principal. We had Mr. Rakesh, who is the vice principal of the junior college, Mr. Jetani, who is the principal of the law college. And uh, we have our dear Shilpa Ma'am, Executive Secretary of Seva Mandal. And so on behalf of all the participants, thank you, Preeti. It was a very engaging session. You actually put into practice um, through your, uh, the way that you conducted the session, all the things that we need to keep in mind. And I think that what you reiterated is that communication is the key. If you get the communication right, then everything else will fall into place. When I invited Dr. Uh, Shirodkar to do this session, I had heard her do this, a similar session last week. Uh, she told me that she never repeats a presentation. She always works on it fresh. And I was wondering how you could do that, but uh, you actually did it. Okay? It's just not even a week since I heard, uh, heard you speak last and you just have done something completely new. And that shows the quality of a good teacher. You'll constantly be able to, like you said, to reimagine. I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions uh, that will be cropping up in uh, minds of teachers, especially teachers who are just learning how to do this, just experimenting with it. So I really look forward to having you with us again. And once again, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I, yeah, with, with your, uh, would you like to say something, Priti? Otherwise, I just had two more lines to say. No, no, no. I was going to request Minoti to. Yeah, I need to share something, right? Yeah, I, uh, I would like to use this uh, opportunity since the entire BMN family is here. Uh, Prajakta, who has been with the BCA department for uh, almost two years now, uh, will be leaving us. Uh, Projector, can you just um, put your video on? Projector? Can you just, yeah, can you put your, uh, yeah, all right, okay. Yeah. Just like, uh, unfortunately, the lockdown situation is such that we cannot uh, give you a, a farewell in the true spirit of Dr. Gaiman College. But we would like to wish you all the best from everyone who is going to join the husband in the US. Yeah. Okay. Stay Thank you so much, ma'am. Stay connected. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sure. As you go, once a part of BMN. Always a BMNI. Yes, of course. Always a BMNI. We will not allow you to forget us. Yes, sure, ma'am. How can we I forget you all? Yeah, we will constantly yeah. be drawing you back. We wish you yes. all the best, Prajakta. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, Thank uh, you so much. We look forward to giving you a proper party. Um, perhaps the next time you visit us, once the lockdown is over, and maybe by then you would have returned back on a holiday. Prajakta is leaving on the 26th of June. So yes. All the best, uh, Prajakta, and stay safe. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minoti, for sharing this. Yes. Yeah, so, um, shall we round up then? Sure. So, once again, thank you, everybody. And, uh, Thanks a lot. Yeah. And thank you um, to Dr. BMN College. Stay safe, everybody. And take care of yourselves. And good luck, Prajakta. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Pleasure.